Welcome to the Alpha Genix Podcast, where every week we talk to incredible guests from around the world of biohacking, well being, men's health, and more. Here's your host, co founder of Alpha Genix, Ross Tompkins. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome today's guest, Luke Lehman, all the way from Australia and founder of Muscle Nerds. Welcome, Luke. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we met last year at the Silverback yeah. Summit yeah. in Austin and absolutely loved your presentation. It was super Thank inspiring, you. really interesting. And it's taken us six months, hasn't it, to, to get together and, and get you on the show. But I really appreciate it. Yeah, busy. We're both busy. So it's it's been kind of back and forth. Finally did it. We finally got there. Uh, absolutely. I'd rather be busy than bored. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> So for anyone who hasn't heard of Luke Lemon, Lehman, um, who is Luke? How did you get started? And what is a muscle nerd? Oh, yeah, good, good question. The origin story. It's always the origin story, right? Um, it's like a Marvel yeah. movie, um, except I'm no superhero. <laughs> Wish I was, but um, so like I got my start when I was very young. So I'm, I'm living in Australia now, but I'm, I'm originally from Texas, not far from uh, where we're in Austin. So if you go about an hour away, way out in the country, I'm from a little small country town. And so as every young man in Texas is expected to, I had to play gridiron football. And so we got started early because in a small town like mine, we grew up with less than 7,000 people in the town. So there was nothing to do. Like you, you're either fighting or playing sports or, you know, I, I was in the, I'm kind of in that weird, that zennial generation where we just started having like technology in the home. So I was born without it, but I got it very early. So, you know, Nintendo and, and all that type of stuff, but we weren't really interested in that too much in the country we were playing, playing football. So um, started lifting weights when I was like eight years old to get ready for that and sneaking into the, uh, into the high school and the junior high when I wasn't supposed to and lifting weights. And at about 14 is when we finally got the internet. So this is 1992. And that opened the world to me because up to that point, everything that I was studying was only what I could find in our local library. So it was like Jane Fonda books and like really crappy workout books from like the sixties and seventies. But when I got the internet, that opened up Charles Poliquin, who later became my mentor, and I became somewhat of a protege and, and took over parts of his job when I worked for his company um, later in life. And Charles Staley, Paul Check, all these guys, like, like the heavyweights that were there before the industry was what it was. And so I got my start fairly early, started competing in powerlifting, football, baseball, track and field, but basically everything you could possibly play. And then later I had the opportunity, I'd never been out of Texas, really. I'd only been out of Texas a couple of times by the time I was in my mid twenties. And I had the opportunity to go and basically do a, do a seminar, like attend a seminar by uh, Charles Poliquin, who, if people don't know who that is, he's uh, deceased now, but he was considered one of the world's like leading strength and conditioning coaches in the world. And so I went to a few seminars, kept going, kept that communication, started working for him. And that was my start in the strength conditioning and, and personal training uh, realm. And at the time, I, I think at 19 is when I first started actually training people. I just turned 46. So I've been doing it a very long time. And when I got into the industry, it was one of those things where it was almost laughable. Like there were only a bunch of weirdos like me that were actually being personal trainers. It didn't, it wasn't a real job back then. And like my parents laughed at me and my mom told me it would always be a hobby. I'd never make a career out of it. And now it's like the hottest thing. Everybody wants to be a personal trainer, you know? So, yeah. yeah so all that. And then uh, I met my wife, which is why I moved to Australia. And uh, I left Polygon Group, which is Charles's old company and had no job and started muscle nerds and it was something i had on a back burner so i was working on it just in case i wanted to leave or i got fired or whatever happened and so i'd been kind of working on it just getting stuff set up uh, with my wife and then yeah so i was kind of just thrown into it and we looked at each other and go okay well what are we going to do we didn't have a dime like when i left that company she and i met in australia and two and a half months later she quit both of her jobs sold her car and flew to america to be with me and uh, 
yeah, we had no money. So we we're like, well, what are we going to do? So I made an announcement online and I got inundated with hundreds of messages of people. Can you come to a seminar here? We don't want what you used to do. We want new stuff. Uh, can I train with you? Can we do this? So I was like, oh shit. So it got really, it got real, real quick. And uh, we just kind of got thrown into basically building a company and didn't know what the hell we were doing and still kind of don't know what we're doing. And it's been almost 10 years. I love that. What a, what a fantastic story. Um, and it's, I, so I'm exactly the same age as you, um, 46 as well. I, I'm a physiotherapist by background. And, and what's really interesting hmm. is I trained in the late 90s. And obviously physios, we think we are, well, we're trained to think, you know, we're experts in the musculoskeletal system, but the extent of our exercise um, experience and teachings at university is to do three sets of 10 of pretty much anything. Yeah. Um, and that's it. And then we're off into the world and all of a sudden then you, you, you're you open up to people like Poliquin and yourself and check and you're like, yeah. oh my God, I know, I know nothing. So it, that was super eye-opening for me. It's, it's interesting because like even, even here in Australia, like I do manual therapy, I have massage um, certifications, I have uh, fascial stretch therapy, I've done like fascial, uh, FRC, I've done a Gusky clinic, I've done all this stuff, right? And learning stuff from Charles and, and other people in the industry. When I came over, I was talking to some physios here and apparently in a lot of the universities here in Australia, they don't believe in manual therapy anymore. They just like, just give people these exercises. Don't put your hands on them. It doesn't work. Stretching yeah. doesn't work. This doesn't work. You just do uh, open cans and clamshells and they'll be all right. And the thing yeah. is it, it, some of that stuff will work, especially if you have like occupational injuries or like life injuries. If you get a sports injury, like a sports injury, some of that stuff, they, athletes need bigger things. And sometimes you have to put your hands on them. But unfortunately, a lot of that's been phased out. So basically all the stuff I've learned from Charles and uh, Charles, uh, Paul check and some of the other guys like that really made me very valuable with how I was taking people and fixing them because a using that, like the, the low return on investment stuff, like open cans and things like that, no one's going to do them. It's like, mm -hmm. I would have clients and I'm like, okay, what'd your physio say? Okay, cool. That's, I agree with that. Okay. What they tell you to do all these exercises. Cool. How are they working? They're not working. I go, cool. How many sessions have you done? It's been like four weeks. I think I did them twice and stopped. And I'm like, why do you think they're not working? So yeah. we had to figure out, we had to figure out things they would actually do and do it in the workout while we had them with us. And it's just, it's nuts. Like you have people that won't do their rehab exercises. And then you have, there is a big disconnect between like, not just anatomy, but applied anatomy and functional anatomy and how it helps to work everything in a, like a chain of muscles instead of just trying to isolate a certain area. And I think that's where trainers that have a good knowledge of that and physios pair up really nicely because they each have bits and bobs that work okay separately, but work really well when they're fitted together. So what we tell all of our students is, don't try to fix this. So you're not physios, um, you're not doctors, build a referral network and try to combine your forces. Let's make this like the Avengers and everybody gets together and they do, they do their bit and they talk each other's language and you get to go to fix people. But we're in this um, weird time in the industry where everybody wants to be the lone wolf and nobody wants to be in a wolf pack anymore for some reason. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? Because I'm a big believer in if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And this collaboration this you know when we are there to help the, the person in front of us our client and i think that collaborative approach work, works really well and just to expand on a couple of things you mentioned there there is this big change in in physiotherapy at the moment where it's very hands-off you sit on the other side of a desk and you give them a sheet of paper because this is this is what the research says but my problem with that is science is always changing so we that is just based on some papers now maybe we haven't had the right papers that prove that manual therapy works because we have thousands of years worth of anecdotal evidence to say that it's helpful yeah the other part of that which you touched on there is when you put your hands on someone it really helps to build rapport it helps to build trust helps to build the relationship so then when you say i need you to do these exercises every hour not mm. once a week 
or once every three weeks. You've got to do these often because you're trying to undo months or years worth of deconditioning. You're not going to do that in five minutes. You have mm-hmm. to do it often enough. And if you've got a good relationship and maybe manual therapy helps to, to, to boost that, they're more likely to do the exercises and they're more likely to get better. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, a fantastic physio. He's not too far from my house. And uh, I had a, a Baker cyst and I just could not get, I got my knee hyperextended in jujitsu and uh, it swelled up and it just would not go away. You know, you know, the usual deal, like five or six weeks and eventually, hopefully it drains. And the first time you put some compression on it, it blows back up and it just, and then your knee feels like it's going to explode if you try to flex your knee. And it's like, man, this thing, I can't squat. I can't lunge. I can't do anything. And so I called one of my friends who's a, a exercise physiologist. He goes, go see this guy. He's two blocks from your house. Go see him. And I went and he did it all. He was like, look, we're going to use any tool I think is going to work. So he was like, hands on. We were on force plates. We were doing exercises. They have a full setup. And he, it's the, the whole thing. And then a treatment plan on an app that he made sure I was doing. Or he'd call me and yell at me for not doing my exercises like that. Like that's the way to me, that's the way it should be done. Right. And having some, some accountability after the fact. Without a doubt, because there are, you know, 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, you could see your PT or your physiotherapist once a week for an hour, but there's still six days and 23 hours where it's what you do that really makes a difference. That's it. That's it. Like, you say you're you're not going to fix it with uh, one session. You're going to have to accumulate some some repetition and get and get it done. But definitely. So where so where do you stand on the you know how much emphasis do you put on strength training and how much on cardio? Depends. It depends on the situation, right? So kind of like that uh, what we just talked about. Like you may have somebody that just needs to do rehab exercise. Maybe they just need to work the scapula. Maybe they just need to do internal external rotation, whatever. Um, maybe someone actually needs someone to mo- to physically put their hands on and mobilize that first and teach their brain that these are okay positions and show them where the problem is and how they get out of pain, right? So when we go to things like strength training and we go to things like conditioning, it's, a, it's the same deal. It's a, you do a needs analysis. Where's the client? What is the tool that's going to make the most sense, whether that's cardio, whether that's strength training, whether that's stretching, whether that's dedicated mobility work, whatever that may be. So um, it's it's always a flow chart, right, for me. So it's like, okay, I have to look at my client and go, okay, I have four or five different directions. I have 100% resources. Where do I put each of those percentages? So if I have, for example, uh, somebody comes in and they're massively morbidly obese. Get a guy in who's 400 kilos, 300 kilos. That's big, okay? And a lot of a lot of personal trainers that go, well, they just need to lift weights and diet, okay? That dude doesn't fit on most of the equipment and he's never trained before and he's so massively inflamed that his perception of, uh, of pain is gonna be very, very high. So he's gonna get DOMS. He's not gonna enjoy working out. You have to give him the low-hanging fruit stuff that's not going to make him feel bad first. Let's get some weight off of him and then slowly integrate in other things. It's like everybody can walk or at at least almost. And if they're so big, they can't walk. Great. We can sit in a chair and we can squeeze the muscles for time. We can sit in the chair and we can get a little, one of those little bikes that sits on the ground. He can just pedal stuff. That's going to be low impact. The dude just needs to get moving. If we can get him moving and get some momentum, we can start lifting weights later, right? But now let's look at the complete opposite. Maybe we have somebody that comes in and they're skinny fat. They just don't have any muscle. Cardio is probably not going to be the answer for them. The answer is going to be probably learning how to apply tension to the muscles with some external load and starting to build some muscle to then reappropriate their muscle to fat ratio, right? Yeah. Somebody comes with a high blood pressure, like, Take somebody with high blood pressure, stage two hypertension. They walk in, they got 150 over 95 or 150 over 100. Yeah, best thing to do, let's go put them on the leg press and really jack that blood pressure up. Or how about five by five back squats? Like yeah. these are the things you got to think about before you put somebody under under some type of task. What are the consequences, both positive and negative? You can meet people where they're at, don't you? And yep. do you think there are, there seems to be more and more 
courses popping up to become a trainer you know and some of them are like a day online yeah. or something like that and I mean, what, what do you think, I guess, of, of that type of training? And is there a danger that people are coming out that don't have that understanding? Oh, there's so many, so many avenues you could talk about there. I mean, number one, it's not difficult to become a trainer. Like in America, it's ridiculously easy. I, I got my trainer certification in a two day workshop. Now you had a lot of homework and stuff that you had to do. And I had great teachers. Like one of my teachers was Tom Platts, who, if you know who that was, the, the golden, the golden eagle like basically quadzilla back in the 60s and 70s or 70s and 80s right he was a very well-known uh bodybuilder and then dr fred hatfield which is a very very well-known power lifter like i did have some good teachers but it still was not that you you, you go and you take a test you pass the test the test's not that hard to to pass right so basically anybody could do it my mom could do it for god's sake she doesn't know anything about working out and not that much has changed there are countries like australia is a bit more uh, a bit more dialed in with it. You get your cert three, four, you do apprenticeship type stuff. It takes, you know, a couple of months. You can't just do it in a, a weekend, but, but they still only teach you the most basic stuff. So they only teach you enough to be pretty dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where continuing education comes into play, which is what I do after the fact. It's like, go get your certification and come talk to me. I'll tell you what to do next. And there, there's two components of that. One of those, which is like designing programs. People don't understand like designing programs is both science and art. So we have a, a huge never ending program design course that we built with 140 hours of content. Former people ask questions. We answer them. We continue to upgrade it every now and then. So it's stuff like that. So whether it's us or whoever you go to, somebody who actually knows what they're talking about knows how to put together a program because the first thing you need is a plan. The second part is you need to have experience under the bar. Like you need to train people, but it's also common right now. Everybody wants to be an online trainer because they think it's easy. They're good. It's a big cash cow. It's easy if you're not doing it right. But you have guys that are 21. They've never trained a single person in their life. They've, they've been training themselves for 18 months, and now they're going to train people online. Like, how are you going to do that? Yeah, they don't, have, they don't have the knowledge. No knowledge, no experience. They, <laughs> they have no coach's eye. They can't watch a video and tell somebody where they're screwing up. They have no idea, no clue. It's yeah. insanity right now. You have, I guess it's similar in many areas of, of business in the world, but you have a lot of business coaches that have set up as well. And all they've done is read a book. They've never started a company, grown a company, sold a company, acquired another one. Um, yep. And they're like, I'm going to teach you how to grow yours. So you're like, how? <laughs> like, oh, I read a book. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I read it's a lot of newsletters. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's a fun, funny world that we live in. Um, so do you focus uh, just on training trainers now, or do you still have your own clients too? No, I still have my own clients. Um, I was trying to get out of coaching people a while back, but then I ended up, uh, two coaches decided that were underneath me decided to go do something else. So I ended up inheriting like 40 clients overnight, which was an absolute disaster for about a year and a half. But yeah, I've still got down to about two dozen clients or so. But and between myself... Hmm? You still love it though, is what well, every day. I do. I love it. I love it because the clients I have now are really good. I don't like training people. I don't like training beginners. Like mm -hmm. if someone is a beginner intermediate, we train you, but it's not me. Um, it ends up being like my protege, my mini me, which is my my coach Max. Like he's he is one hundred percent my mini me, and uh, he's the guy. Like he's the guy that does most of the training. I take people like like Ali. I take people who are really advanced, people who are pro athletes, UFC fighters, things like that, or people who are just massively messed up. Like pr pretty much like I'm not a physio, right? Uh, but it's kind of like physio type things. And I work with their physios, but it's like we, we try to think outside of the box. How do we fix this really fast with big stuff and make sure it doesn't come back so they can progress and get out of pain? Yeah, I love, I love that. Yeah. And switching things up a little bit, one of the things you spoke about quite a lot at the Silverback was about performance enhancement. Where does that fit into, I guess, current personal training? Is it something that's, you know, is it everywhere? Is it just a small percentage? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Let's dive into Are that. We talking a, we're talking about uh, supplemental performance enhancement? Yes. Yeah, the good old, the uh, Romanian creatine. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> man, I, like I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge fan. I, I grew up doing powerlifting national level, um, not bodybuilding. I did men's bikini, which is like, uh, like men's physique where you wear the board shorts and you go up there and you do all the posing and all that. But like, I've been in the bodybuilding world for a long time and powerlifting world, strongman world. I've competed in all the above. And, um, you're not, if you're going to compete at a high level, you're not going to compete without something. Now we're probably, that being said, that's a bit more extreme than probably what you're talking about. But I think if we're going to talk about TRT, we also have to talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, um, you're, you see, you see both of it. Um, I messed myself up pretty bad in my twenties and was hypogonadal by the time I was 35, 36. And I was on TRT in America. It was super easy for me to get. They look at your labs and go, cool, here you go. Test Sipionate. Awesome. Let's start at 120. See how you go. I think I ended up at 160, 180 a week. And I was in the like top of the third quartile. Perfect. Felt awesome. Um, but man, over here in Australia, forget about it. Forget about it. I went into a doctor's office for a, uh, for a throat infection and he wanted me, he said, when's the last time you did your labs? I said, well, I did it in November. So it had been like three months ago. Well, I want you to run some more labs. I'm like, cool. I said, don't worry about writing. Don't, don't write a script for it. I'll do it private labs. Cause I'm going to order far more stuff than you're ever going to order for me. Um, and I'm gonna have to pay cash anyway. So I might as well do it myself. And he goes, well, like what? I go, well, I'm going to do testosterone by available testosterone. I'm going to do estradiol. I'm going to do all this stuff. And he goes, do you have low testosterone? I go, yeah. I said, I've been hypogonadal. I'm supposed to be on TRT. I haven't been on TRT in like 10 years because no doctors over here will give it to me. And he looks at my arms and he goes, I don't think you need it. I go, bro, it has nothing. To, I'm, I'm in my forties. It has not, I'm not, it has nothing to do with, this isn't steroids. This isn't competition. I just want to have a healthy libido, sleep better, less depression or less, not depression, but less, you know, the sadness you get with low testosterone. I want to yeah. get a, you know, I want to get a boner that a dog couldn't chew and a cat can't scratch. You know, that's, that's what I'm looking for. And he's like, no, nah, I don't think you need it. And I'm like, great. So I've found two or three doctors. No, not even an option for me because I look like I don't need it. Although my labs show a whole different story. That's, that's absolutely crazy, isn't it? That, and is it still Love like it. that? Yeah, it's still like that. Wow. But you have to jump through hoops. So basically, um, you know, your options, I, I, I need to talk, I need to talk to our boy, Dave, because I know he can get it, but you know what, man, it's just, it's just been, you get so busy, you just forget. Right. <laughs> and, uh, I've talked to some other clinics and they're like, Hey, what do you want? And they're wanting to give me all kinds of stuff. I go, I just want testosterone, man. I just yeah. want, I just want, I just want a little bit of primo testing, just a little bit. Just enough to get me in the, in the middle of the range. I don't care anything. So I don't have the testosterone of a 200 year old man. And they, then they want to go, Oh, you want some Anavar? You want the Winstraw? And I'm like, No, 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 no. I just want just nor. I don't even want sports TRT. I just want TRT. Yeah. 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 Just want to feel back to where you should. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it was you. Some, some someone at the, at the summit said something really fascinating, which is a lot of people jump to the steroids when there's zero point doing that until you've maxed out your own natural TRT and then your supplemental TRT, because what's the point? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have this conversation with a lot of uh, both young men and also old men for two different reasons. So like the young guys want to get on it. And I'm like, look, you guys, I, I, they're like, well, you started taking your 21. I was like, yeah, but I was already lifted for 13 years and I was at like the, I was already at the top of my genetic limit. And so I was competing in powerlifting. So it was either lose or show up to a gunfight with a gun. So that's why I did it. Cause I had a choice because I'm six foot tall at 220 pounds to 240 pounds. So I think I was in the two, 242s. I was having to compete with guys that were five foot eight, five foot six. So mechanically, I'm at a massive disadvantage. So you have two choices. You either get really fat, get a huge gut, shave your head, grow a goatee, and start listening to Satan Thrasher music like the rest of them. Or you get on gear and you keep your abs and you look good and you feel good. I'm like, which one, which one is the least healthy option? And when I took PEDs, I didn't take a lot. Like I was one of those guys. I just took, I took nonstop, but very low dose, which is probably worse. Right. So 
Um, I wasn't the kind of guy that was taking like three grams of gear like everybody else. I was taking very low doses. I just took it for way too long. But uh, but yeah, so I, I, I tell them, I'm like, look, don't you want to see what you can get done naturally and optimize that first? And if you want to progress in competition, then get on things and make that choice at that time when you've earned the right to do it, mm -hmm. right? Now, for the older guys, you get I get guys all the time like, should I get on gear? I'm like, no, you're 35% body fat. I reckon if we got you to 15% body fat, your testosterone, testosterone would probably go up. You also drink like two cartons of beer all week. <laughs> That's definitely screwing up your testosterone. You don't sleep. You go to bed drunk. You wake up at all times. You go to bed at all times. You work 70 hours a week. You got terrible toxic relationships everywhere. You got a lot of other stuff you need to fix. We can probably fix it with lifestyle stuff and nutrition and then maybe some supplementation. And if we can't, okay, now maybe you talk to the doctor, but I, I don't think like I, I firmly believe that fat, fat guys especially should not do testosterone. What about the argument that their testosterone is so low that they can't get motivated to get started? Is, is there started is there an argument to say actually that could could inject some i guess motivation and get them spiraling in a positive way i think if we're gonna if we're gonna and that's not a bad i mean that that's a good thought process right however i personally think it should be on a trial type of thing we'll start it with three months if you don't get your lifestyle shit together within three months and show me some progress we're done and you can find a different doctor right because if they just take it and they're like, ooh, I'm feeling a bit better, and they're not doing anything with it, they're probably never going to, right? Yeah. It's just like, it's like going to a general practitioner and your cholesterol's high, your blood pressure's high, and you go, well, I'll just take an ACE inhibitor and a diuretic, and I'll take an antihypertensive. Oh, great, my numbers look awesome. No, your numbers only look good with the drugs. Your numbers need to look good without it. Those should be Band-Aids until you get your shit together and get, get every, until you can get off of it. Right. They, yeah. th those things shouldn't be an all the time thing unless it's a genet genetic issue and, and you just you didn't win the genetic lottery. Yeah, yeah. The genetic lottery. Um, I think that we live in such a fast paced world where people just want a quick fix. You know, that everything's on a plate now, isn't it? Like you get food delivered to your house, you get anything yep. you want delivered to your house. I think people just want something now. So this idea that, you know, I can take PDs or sport TRT or whatever, and all of a sudden in their head, they're like, I don't need to do any work and I'm just going to end up looking like, you know, a pro athlete. I, I think yeah. that comes into it, doesn't it? It does. It does. It's like, it, guys, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't, you still have to do the work. Like, um, I remember a famous quote by Louis Simmons of Westside Barbell. When people were talking smack about the guys at Westside being on gear, he said, look, I've never seen a bottle of testosterone squat 800 pounds, right? <laughs> you, still, you still have to do the work. I mean, when I, when I was in Texas, because we're such close proximity to, to Mexico, it was very easy to get steroids in Texas. Mm -hmm. I reckon, and this is 20 years ago, I reckon at least 50 to 60% of the guys in the gym were on gas. I reckon, and I reckon now it's probably 75, 80% now. And yeah. none of them know what they're doing. None of them have any idea what they're doing. Hell, a lot of the doctors I talk to don't even know what they're doing. Right. And it's like, like I said, like if you, if, if you have somebody who's really overweight, like significantly overweight, what's, what's the likelihood that that testosterone is going to aromatize anyways and be completely useless and give yeah. them estrogenic side effects and create further health problems? So it's like, what's the solution? Well, we'll give them, we'll give them a Remedex. Cool. Now you fuck up their cholesterol. Excellent. And what happens yeah. when you get off your Remedex? They get this massive estrogen backlash and they feel like a bag of dicks. Like, hey, wouldn't it be better to make an agreement and say, look, let's try to get the weight off first. If you need the motivation, we'll start with a low dose. But if you don't get at least X number of kilos off within the three to four month range, we're done. Like, I think yeah. that's fair. And that gives them an incentive to actually do something about it. Yeah. It's a, it's a tool in your toolbox, isn't it? It's yeah. like, it's, but if you've got, 
yeah, if, if you've got a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. So you kind of like, I'll just have more of that and that'll fix it. No, you've got to fix your lifestyle. You've got to be eating the, right, doing the right they, exercise, getting yeah. good sleep. And they need to look the sub the testosterone is a supplement. It's not yeah. the it's not the cornerstone. It's an additive. And yeah. it's like it would be like buying a two thousand dollar piece of shit car and putting race fuel in it. Like, mm -hmm. why? Like the car's not going any faster. It's just gonna blow up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I, I think it, it's you said something interesting a, a moment ago as well. I see this all the time, which is you hear people say, "Oh, they're they're taking steroids. That's why they look that way." And you're like, mm, "It doesn't quite look like that. They're not sitting on the sofa injecting yeah. whatever, and they wake up the next day and look like that. That takes discipline. That takes hard work. That takes an amazing." like yeah discipline to eat right get to the gym get good sleep it's not magic like yeah but it, there's this misinterpretation of it i guess and none of it's magic it's just repetition of things you probably don't want to do to get a body you want it's like if i want to buy something that's really expensive i don't want to spend the money on it but if i really want that i'm gonna to have to work hard accumulate the cash and then buy the thing that i want to buy building physique's the same way it's just that it's it's not cash you're playing with the the resources time it just takes time and patience and just repeatedly nailing the basics over and over and telling not really telling other people no because that's never the problem the problem is telling yourself no because at the end of the day too building a a, a nice physique is so heavily dominated by nutrition like you don't even need that much weight training to build a nice physique but if you want to get lean and you want to build muscle, you have to nail the diet. And that's the hardest thing for people because like you said, Uber Eats, there's always a celebration and they don't, no one misses a celebration, you know? And some people think that a celebration is every day that ends in Y. It's like, bro, like there is, but it's like, you, you also deal with these, these idiots who the anti-dieting culture and they're like, diets don't work. Diets do work if you stick to the fucking diet and look at the diet as a lifestyle modification. Like, of course, if you go back to what made you fat, you're just going to get fat again. But if you stick to the fundamentals of what got you lean, mm -hmm. guess what's going to keep you lean? It ain't McDonald's. It's exactly yeah. what got you lean. But they look at it like disordered eating and tracking's disordered eating and all this. It's not. They're all tools. They're all tools. It, it just depends on how you frame it. But the biggest demon that people face is within themselves. It's the inability to tell themselves no when they want something really bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. There's, you hear quite a lot of that nowadays, don't you? Like it's genetic why somebody's overweight and it's not their fault and all of those things. And you're like, I'm pretty sure if you don't put it in your mouth, you're not going to put weight on. Yeah. And look, the thing is, look, the thing is genetics are about 25% of it. 75% of your genetics, you have absolute control over depending on the choices you make. Mm -hmm. So when I was, when I was younger, when I was 15, when I was 15, I, I had a massive underbite and I had jaw surgery and they cut pieces of my jaw, moved it. And I had my jaw wired shut for six weeks. I lost 40 pounds, 40. So when people good. tell me, it, when they tell me it's not about calories and calories, I'm like, cool, let's wire your mouth shut and let's see how quickly you, you lose weight. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's like the GLP-1 agonist, isn't it? It's like if it was genetic, when you had that, it would make no difference. But yeah. actually, they take Manjaro or Zempic and they lose weight. And you're like, well, if it was in your genes, it would make no difference. You could look at, you could look at some of the older real nefarious drugs like Adipex. Like you take Adipex, you're basically on freaking speed all the time and you don't want to eat. People lose tremendous amount of, of weight, right? But, you know, go look at it. You've ne have you ever seen a fat crackhead or a fat meth head? No. Yeah, yeah real tiny. I've never um, seen a fat person smoking meth. Of course, I've not really been around a lot of people smoking meth, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, like, have many of your friends do that? <laughs> I used to club. <laughs> What do you think? Do you think, you know, we know that our muscle is the largest organ in the body and there is a really high correlation to longevity. The heavier your muscle is, the longer your health span will be. Mm. Do you think there is an argument that improving muscle using low-dose PEDs 
could it ever be construed as a good thing? Because if we improve our musculature, surely there has to be a benefit there. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Look, that's I mean, if you look at this really old um, study by Tufts University, and it is a, a, it's a they made a book out of it. It's like the top ten factors for lowering all cause mortality, anti aging, and all this. One of the top at the list was not losing, like being strong and not losing strength, and having muscle and not losing it. Now, a lot of people, including my mentor Charles, took this the wrong way. They to a lot of guys, especially people who are biased towards weightlifting, people who are biased towards bodybuilding, will take this as well. That paper shows that the more muscle mass you have and the stronger you are, the better. But that's not really what the point of it was. The point was don't get sarcopenia, don't lose muscle, and maintain your strength for the rest of your life. It wasn't, you know, take a hundred milligrams of anadrol and a thousand uh, milligrams of uh, test and, uh, and 500 milligrams of trend and get as big and strong as humanly possible. So there's, there's all these extremes, like the body doesn't like extremes. It likes staying somewhere in the bell curve. So it's like you have a point where you put on a bit of muscle mass. That's a good thing. You put on a ton of muscle mass at some, there's a tipping point where that's no longer actually a healthy thing to do anymore. So it's, it's, it's knowing what those, like what those tipping points are. And there was a study that came out a few years ago talking about uh, BMI is BMI actually relevant. And what they said in the study was it actually still is relevant because if you look at like, I'm considered, I'm considered overweight based on the BMI. Okay. Now I'm a big dude. I'm heavy boned. I've got a lot of muscle. Um, being overweight uh, with the BMI from like bodybuilding or weightlifting, whatever, not a big deal. That's part of it. But if you're in the class one, class two obesity part of BMI, you're either on a massive amount of PEDs or you're a lot fatter than you think, right? Which neither of those things are necessarily healthy. So what we need to do is not throw BMI, like don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but to put it in better context like a new kind of version of looking at it. So if you are a, a guy and you're lifting weights and you're in the overweight category and you're, you're lean, like you say sub 15%, you're doing pretty good. If you start moving up to that higher class of obesity, again, you're probably taking it too far either with body fat or you're taking it too far with how much gear you're taking and you're probably not taking TRT anymore. Yeah. Because I've never yeah. seen anybody natural that's in a class one, class two obesity with that much muscle mass. I'm sure there's a freak outlier, but I've never actually seen it. But I've seen a lot of guys who are taking tons of gear, like way too much, that definitely fit that category. And they're definitely not healthy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What, what do you think is a sustainable body fat percentage for someone natural and someone who is using PEDs? Where can someone stay and, you know, and have that, life where they can go out and do what they want and not have to just you know be super disciplined all the time yeah i mean look again it's it's it's, it's not that difficult guys like it's the hard part is getting there and realistically at the ranges i'm gonna say it's not that difficult it just takes time and it takes patience it takes a little bit of discipline but i like keeping guys around 15 percent or under which 15 percent is a lot leaner than people think because people go to a dexa 15% on a DEXA could be 18 to 21%. Like it's not actually real 15 or they'll get down to say 10 on a DEXA. And I'm like, no, 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 you're more like 13 to 16, somewhere around there. If you're 10 on a DEXA, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And that's, that is not that difficult to maintain once you get there. Like if you look at Allie, like Allie maintains this incredible shape year round. She doesn't train a lot anymore. Like we trained a lot to get there, mainly because she thought she had to. We had, we actually had this conversation this morning. It's like she hasn't been able to train as much because she's been traveling and busy and all that. She's like, I can't believe I'm maintaining my physique. Is it because we built to this point? I'm like, no, no, no. It's because you didn't need to train that much anyways. We only did that because psychologically you enjoyed it and you felt like it was necessary. Now you're learning that it's not, actually not that necessary to do the stuff we've had to do for the last six years. You can actually maintain and make improvements. They'll be slower, but you can still do it without having to dedicate um, like a part-time job to your, your training and nutrition. Right? Yeah. So, so like, I think 
once you get to about 12, so I'm sitting around like 12 to 14 percent, and I maintain that pretty much year round, except over the holidays, I'll creep up to like 15, 17 percent. But I'll usually, if guys want to put on weight, I'll give them a range of like 12 to 17. Once we start getting a little bit past 17, I'm probably going to start doing a mini cut and dial it back down because the closer you get to 20 and above, the more insulin resistant you're going to get. You're going to get anabolically resistant. A lot more of your calories are going to be biased into fat stores and away from muscles. Now, steroids do change a lot of that, so you, you can get away with a lot more. But then you're dealing with inflammation from adipokines. You're dealing with inflammation, just systemic inflammation, hyperimmune response, which is going to lead to inflammation. That's all going to lead to uh, higher sympathetic nervous system drive, higher levels of glucocorticoids. So the fatter you get, the more opportunity or the more preference you're going to bias towards that bulk of being put in the fat instead of being put in the muscle, right? So you might as well just keep it at a point where it's maintainable and you're making slow progress. People try to put weight on too fast and they don't realize anabolic processes work very slowly from an evolutionary perspective. There, there's no inherent benefit of being 120 kilos and 6% body fat as a hunter gatherer. There's no evolutionary benefit. That's actually a, 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 that's actually a negative thing because you're easier to hunt, right? The skinny, the skinny lean dudes are going to outrun you and you're going to get eaten by the lion. So you have to think of it in that way. And a lot of people will poo poo that. But my point of it is we're not that biochemically physiologically different than we were say 10,000 years ago. So catabolic processes work very quickly anabolic processes work very slowly and it just goes for like that feast and famine during a year right so you you live in a bounty during the summertime you eat a lot you put on some fat and that fat lasts you all winter you lose all that fat during the winter and then you go and you hunt again right so i think that people need to be a little bit more uh they need to be a little bit more diligent at keeping their body composition at a reasonable level and think about where you're going to be in 12 months, 24 months, five years, instead of trying to put on two years worth of growth in 12 weeks. Yeah. To have that longer term outlook is going to yeah. be helpful. Yeah. Rather than I want to do this, I want to get ready for the, you know, my beach body in the summer and then they forget about it and just have that longer term discipline. I guess it comes down to we've used that word a lot. Well, and if you have that longer term outlook, you can recomp over time and then you never have to get overweight or over, we'll say not overweight, we'll say overly fat. Like mm -hmm. most of my clients that are really lean, they're, they continue to put on muscle, but we're, we're looking at like, can we gain 100, 150 grams of weight on average per week? Some weeks we don't gain weight, some day, weeks we lose, but we're looking at the average over time. And if, I, if somebody's putting on four or five kilos a year, I'm pretty happy with that. And we don't have to really clean up a lot of that body fat. That means you get to eat more longer and you never have to really do a deficit unless you have a photo shoot or you have videos or something or you have to do a, you know, be on stage. You want to get lean. Okay, we'll do a, a really quick three week cut. Catabolic systems work really fast. You can knock off a couple of percent in a few weeks and you're good. Where do you stand on the GLP-1 agonist? So if someone creeps up to 20%, would you ever consider advising that to like, right, come on, let's get this in, help you get on top of your appetite, or do you think it's not necessary? No, I think I think it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. I mean, we've got modern medicine to help. If if you have, I have, uh, I have a client that's supposed to be on it. She can't get it because her country ran out of it. So it's like, it was a godsend for her because she has a really hard time controlling her appetite and telling herself no. And it was the first time when she got on that. I advised her. Her doctor said, I think we should try this. I said, it's a good idea. Get on it. Why not? Other than the fact it's really expensive where you are. It's like if that's what it takes for you to finally get there because you're doing the work, you're doing the work in the gym, you're getting the sleep, you're getting your conditioning done, you're doing everything. You just have a hard time with the diet. Use the tool you have available. I'd use it if I could get it. I don't even have a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's that tool in your toolbox again, isn't it? Yeah. I'd rather people take GLP than clenbuterol and DNP. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because you have a lot of the 
the sort of underground labs again and now making this as well but i read something online recently and it was like only 30 percent of the semaglutide made by this underground lab was actually what it was supposed to be i believe it some of it was water some of it was something else entirely so i think if you're gonna do that you've got to get the, the proper stuff the kosher stuff yeah. i mean the end user doesn't know like you get a vial of pre-mixed bacteriostatic water you have no idea if it's in there or not like and like i love peptides uh bpc man that's a personal favorite of mine cjc 1295 ipamorelin that was the that combo was the one that took away a bunch of niggles that i had for four years that i could not fix and within two weeks completely gone and never came back um wow. and i i would never buy that stuff underground no way um i i would rather i would trust to some point only because i can't get anything else and, and i haven't like i said i haven't been on anything in years but i would trust underground testosterone before i would before way before i would trust underground peptides because at least with the testosterone you're gonna have to work a little bit to make it look legit and people talk a little bit more and the the results from that are so much faster that you can talk to somebody like hey did you try this lab and like yeah it was really good I, I gained like four kilos in a month i'm like okay so you know there's talk and it's cheap like it doesn't make any sense to make fake underground testosterone anymore because it's so cheap like peptides are the new thing you're selling people a bottle of peptides for 150 bucks and it's just water it's a great yeah, yeah. return on your investment exactly and i think because because trt the the effects as you say are obvious whereas with some of the peptides I and mean, especially the longevity peptides like you can't feel it and you're not supposed to but you're taking it because there is argument arguments say it's going to make you live a longer healthier life so mm. you can't feel it anyway so you could take that for 30 years and not take and it won't make a blind bit of difference apart from yeah. your wallet a bit smaller that's right and I'm, if you've had real there are some peptides you know that you do feel something like you'll feel the little, a little rush and like, it's almost like a little night, mini nice and rushing like, Whoa, Whoa. And you, you, you feel that. Right. Um, I had a, a doctor here that I, I get peptides from, from now and again, but I haven't done any in like four or five years. I'm due. One thing that I, I would thought was crazy is when I did the CJC, Ipamorelin and BPC, my gray hair went away and it turned Brown for like six months. So now that I'm getting more gray, I'm like, man, I should probably do another cycle. But because I get it through a doctor, it's ungodly expensive. Uh, but at least I know it's, it's right. But I remember he he convinced me to take uh, S22. I'm like, I didn't know anything about it. I'm like, I don't really care about testosterone. He goes, I'll just try it. I'm like, all right. It felt like I was injecting hot molten lava. And I was like, nah, I just threw it away. I was like, I'll just, I'll just go get some testosterone because this stuff sucks. And now they what make is, it in a pill. I've not heard of that. What is S22? I have to look it up, but it's one of it's one of the SARMs, and uh, he's real high on it. He says he sees a lot of a lot of benefits from it, but wow. I just just when you injected it, it, it it lumped up and welted, and it felt like you were injecting basically uh, basically isopropyl alcohol. It, it was not fun. I was like, screw that, I'm not, I'm, yeah. I'm out. I'll do the other ones, but I'm out with that one. Absolutely. With your BPC, did you put that? um directly to where your niggles were or did you put it into the belly or wherever no i just put it in the belly most of mine were in the ribs anyways so um i broke my ribs on this side twice and this side once and then the second time i broke my ribs on the right side i couldn't lift my arm up for oh, four or five months and I went all over the world to find somebody to fix it. A buddy of mine had just done some soft tissue stuff at some place in Florida. They do cranial stuff. And then also like really brutal, brutal types of like hands-on stuff. I was like, look, I'm desperate. I'll do anything. I drove four hours to see him. Somebody had to hold me down because it was so painful. I was crying, but he worked on me for an hour and I could get my arm overhead. And I was like, oh, fantastic. So I went to see him one more time and we solidified it. But when I started doing jujitsu again and judo, it still would start, it would hurt. I'd do a session. I couldn't train for five days. So this doctor was right around the corner and I went and talked to him and he's like the leading guy in all of Australia for peptides. And he was like, we'll do these three things. And two weeks later, I was like, holy shit, I have no pain anymore. And, and I would go to class 12 to 15 hours a week and train hard, no more rib pain. That's incredible. Is there 
Is there anything anything that we haven't covered that you think our viewers and listeners should know about you or about, I guess, exercise in general? Uh, yeah, I mean, where do you start? There's so many things, right? So many things. And besides what we covered, it's like, I do firmly believe that if someone is going to get TRT, the first thing they need to get set in their head is they're going to do the work other than injecting the, the testosterone or rubbing the cream on or rubbing the gel on. They have to get it in their head that this is incredibly helpful and it's life changing, but it's not going to work as well as you want it to unless you do all the other things that you have to, which again, does not have to, doesn't mean you have to do a part-time job being a bodybuilder. You just go to the gym, three, three full body workouts a week, training hard, get your steps in, get some, just some light aerobic cardio in, like get, get back in shape. And a lot of, I've seen a lot of changes, just people getting them better aerobic shape because our industry, they're all like lift weights, lift weights. You don't need to do cardio, but now it's changing like 10 years ago when I was telling everybody that you're all out of shape, you need to get in more aerobic fitness. They're like, ah, oh, you're smoking crack. You don't know what you're talking about. Now everybody's becoming hybrid athletes because they see the changes. I mean, if you even look at, th think about this. Okay. We're making testosterone. What delivers that testosterone through the rest of your body? Your bloodstream. Good luck. Yeah. You have high blood pressure. You have vessels that won't dilate. You have really poor blood flow. One of those places is going to be to your ding dong and balls. How the hell, like how the hell are you going to move stuff around the body? How are you going to take care of that? I remember Charles, Charles used to talk about, uh, guys who can't get a, a rock hard boner. He says, it's basically a, a, basically a heart attack for your pecker. If you can't get a good hard boner, you're probably 10 years away from having a heart attack. Yeah. That's, that's, I think that's pretty, you know, recognized now as a thing, seven to eight yeah. years after that happens, you're probably going to have a cardiac event. And yet most men don't realize. Well, and most men think they're just going to inject testosterone. That's automatically going to make them horny and hell of a beetle, but that's not true. That's yeah. not true. Like you still need to get blood flow. You still need to be able to dilate. So part of that is getting control of your resting heart rate, getting control of your blood pressure and trying to get that, trying to get in some reason about a shape. And here's the thing. You start taking testosterone and you get a big hard boner and you got about one minute of sex into you before you're out of, out of breath. Like that's, you can't even use what you've been taking it for. So you might as well get in good, good physical condition. hundred percent. Luke, absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, if people are watching and they want to reach out to you, what's the best place to get in get in contact? Probably, probably. I, we, I hate social media, but you got to do it right. So Instagram, muscle nerds underscore education. Uh, if people like memes, but do not message me about anything that has to do with my career on Luke Lehman. If you like unpolitically correct, dirty, nasty memes and things, that's that's it. So. Um, and then, yeah, info at musclenerds.net. That's where you can you find us. Brilliant. Luke, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'll let you get on with your day. Sure. I'll speak to you soon. All right. Take care. See you soon. Thank you for listening to the Alpha Genics Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss next week's episode. For more resources on Alpha Genics and men's health, visit alphagenics.co.uk. Until next time.